part of the uh, archive. archive at uh, Georgia State and also be used you know, in a project we're doing on the making of modern Atlanta. So we will probably be back to you to do an audio, a video interview okay. as well. Now, is this going to be a book or it's just a document? It's a, this will be a book. A book. Yeah, this will be a book. Right. So this is Andrea Young, Teresa Taylor interviewing Bill Clement. Um, yeah, so this will be a book and a uh, um, documentary and uh, the plan, and you know, the plan includes a conference, you know, that we would really bring people together and kind of talk about what are some of the implications of the Atlanta, sort of the Atlanta way. Oh, wait, yeah, I like that term. For, you yeah. know, for moving forward and, um, uh, you know, and, and how other, other how Atlanta can build on it and how other cities can learn, you know, from, uh, from, from the Atlanta way and how you, um, uh, how you manage, you know, growth in a way that tries to be equitable and include the diversity of the community and all that. So, um, so we, um, we're sort of starting off with standard questions for everybody to just talk about how, um, um, where you came from and how you ended up starting your career in Atlanta. Well, I'm a native, so <laughs> I started here and I ended here, you know. But uh, Atlanta is uh, my home, and uh, one of the questions, if I remember correctly, was uh, what did Atlanta look like when I uh, was mm -hmm. growing up, uh, mm -hmm. especially more as I can remember well. Uh, the Marriott Marquis was the tallest building in Atlanta, and it had as an attraction that uh, revolving dome, mm -hmm. and, and people would come from miles around just to see the hotel because it was the first open uh, architecture, and the, the, the elevators were outside, and but uh, you contrast that to what is available in downtown Atlanta and metro Atlanta today. It's just uh, like uh, night and uh, night and day. Mm -hmm. Where did you grow up in Atlanta? What were you on Auburn Avenue or where, where was your? I was born here, Andrea, but at six, uh, my parents moved to North Carolina. So I ended up going to public schools mm -hmm. in North Carolina, but we came every summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my base was. Um, was uh, Auburn Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, my grandfather's uh, home was on um, Houston Street, which is right. now called John Wesley Dobbs right. Uh, Avenue. Right, right. So, what was Hunter, what was uh, Auburn Avenue like then? Oh, it was a um, Fortune magazine called it uh, the Wall Street of uh, Black America. I mean, there were all kinds of businesses that were. Um, movie theaters, there were barber shops, there was a Yates and Milton pharmacy, um, uh, open air markets, and it was just a lot of bustle, a lot of commerce, a lot of trade going on. The Royal Peacock was was another big draw, and of course one of the features of Atlanta, um, which I didn't recognize at the time growing up, was that they had three strong black financial institutions. They had Citizens Trust Bank, which was on Auburn Avenue, they had Mutual Federal Savings Loan, which was on Auburn Avenue. And of course, uh, Atlanta Life, which was on Auburn Avenue. So it, it was a lot of hustle and bustle, Andrea, and um, and uh, I, I just love coming here because we, at that time, uh, the Rolla Durham area was a relatively small, and so to come to Atlanta, even though it was not quote anything uh, close to where it is today, was still uh, a big city for me. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you all were in Durham? We lived in Durham. My uh, father was in the insurance business with North Carolina Mutual. Mm -hmm. What did the, um, so what was the contrast between Durham, like say the black community in Durham and in Atlanta? Well, surprisingly, it was very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, uh, we only had one college. It was called at that time North Carolina College, but um, uh, Durham had the North Carolina Mutual, which, which when I was growing up was the largest black business in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it had Mechanics and Farmers Bank, which is a, a minority-owned bank, and then it had Mutual Savings Loan. And so I, I think that, you know, when you have those financial institutions, you have educational uh, opportunities and a lot of entrepreneurs, minority entrepreneurs, it just creates. And so Atlanta was very similar to that, except on a bigger, you know, bigger scale. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it was very similar. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, that, you know, you really see in Atlanta is that focus in the black community on economic development. And, but talk about some of the role that your grandfather played in, in Atlanta. And well, my, my grandfather, whose name is uh, John Wesley Dobbs, was uh, one of the early, early uh, civil rights uh, pioneers. He had a, 
a philosophy uh, which revolved around what he called the three B's, uh, the book, the ballot, and the buck. And uh, his base was the uh, Prince Hall uh, Masons, uh, which was a very, very strong organization uh, nationally. And, but in, in Georgia, they had a very strong base. And so he was independent. He was almost like the preacher or the undertaker uh, in, in a white establishment could not, quote, get to him. And so he was very active in getting people registered uh, to uh, vote. Uh, he was an early um, uh, director of Citizens Trust Bank. He was on the uh, board and put up uh, uh, money for the initial uh, uh, stock. And then he was a big, big uh, advocate on education. He only did two years at Morehouse, but he had six daughters, and all of them uh, went to school. Uh, and they all had graduate degrees. They all had graduate degrees. They all, all six went to Spelman. Uh, four of the five, I mean, uh, six of the, uh, uh, all six of them went to graduate school, and then three of them had the PhD. Wow. So education was a big. And so when he talked it, I mean, he, he, he lived. Um, but it, he, he and a gentleman by the name of A. T. Walton were the early. Uh, power brokers uh, in Atlanta, and the term that your daddy uses, the Atlanta way, was really fostered by uh, that group on the black side and Mayor Hartsfield on the uh, white side, who realized in order to get things done, um, he had to involve this large constituency in Atlanta, and uh, they they would work out things uh, like the police, uh, the first black police were housed in the uh, Butler Street Y. Um, other appointments that he would make, and, 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 and so that was maybe the beginning. I go back to Hartsfield. I know there are all the mayors before him, but I think Hartsfield was the beginning of this um, um, Atlanta way. And one of the things you said about that he had that independence. Now, what what kind of I mean, what was the importance of having that independence? Well, you couldn't be <laughs> you couldn't be bought by the uh, white power structure, and uh, you couldn't be fired. You couldn't be intimidated. And most communities, uh, black communities that were strong, had uh, you know ministers who were in leadership positions, uh, usually the undertaker. But other than that, um, if you had a good job, you usually worked for a majority firm, and so uh, you were not able to be quote uh, independent. And so one of the things that that made uh, Grandpa Dobbs so powerful was that he had this base of, um, of, of free and accepted Masons who were all black men, and uh, that was his source of income and also his source of pride, and uh, his uh, gave him the independence to uh, speak up for uh, matters concerning the black community. And uh, what about the other black businesses in, uh, on Auburn Avenue? Uh, Bill Calloway, uh, Calloway Realty was on. Um, there's another one called the Georgia Insurance Brokerage. Uh, T.M. Alexander and Bill Calloway were on Auburn Avenue. Uh, Gates and Milton, um, the Royal Theater. Um, the, I don't know if it's called the Royal Theater, but uh, then there's the Royal Peacock. And then they had a big open uh, market, the Andrea, and, and people would just kind of come off the street and you would buy. And uh, it, it was just very vibrant. I mean, mm -hmm. very, very vibrant. One of the one of the writers um, that looked at Atlanta says that there was a real there was a real intentionality about building the economic power in the black community. Do you, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think once they get past. Um, that, that generation probably did open up uh, some doors, but I, I think it was uh, Ivan Allen and um, uh, that crowd and uh, a group called the Atlanta Action Forum. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Has anyone talked about that yet? Um, not yet. Yeah. Well, the Atlanta Action Forum, I went back and read on it uh, last mm -hmm. night, uh, was a group that, as I think back on some of the key points, and I have some other mm -hmm. uh, data points that I mm -hmm. can share with you, but mm -hmm. it was founded in, in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, was was co-headed. The initial co-heads were Mills B. Lane, who was the president of CNS Bank, mm -hmm. and Bill Calloway. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really, uh, Andrea, where they negotiated a lot of these arrangements or uh, economic sharing and the whole concept of joint ventures was born. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, Herman Russell and Jesse Hill were original members of the uh, action Forum. They were the only two business people. Most of the other people were either ministers or 
John Cox, who was at the Butler Street Y, Lyndon Wade, who was at the uh, Atlanta Urban League. These were nonprofits. Mm -hmm. But but Jesse and Herman really got an opportunity to benefit from this exposure to the majority community. And uh, that was founded in 71. And in Maine, three years later, was elected uh, mayor. And Jesse was Jesse and Herman were very instrumental. And so it, 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 it shifted the political power from the white community now to the black community, and then that was an infrastructure, this action forum, to uh, allow them to have conversations, and a lot of positive things were uh, discussed there, and one of the big ones was the uh, decision by Mayor Jackson to employ the uh, concept of joint ventures at the airport, mm -hmm. which was in 1975, 76, mm -hmm. and that really, that really was kind of, in my mind, the beginning of the Atlanta way in terms of economics, mm -hmm. of how to share economics. And from then on, every, every deal in the public sector uh, was done on a joint venture basis. And eventually, uh, it spilled over to firms like Coca-Cola and Home Depot and all, and they, they <coughs> began to have minority business development programs. And, uh, and, and, and I think that this gave uh, Atlanta a, a base, an economic base. I mean, we probably have more you know, wealthy millionaire uh, uh, people in Atlanta, many of whom are business people, mm -hmm. because of the opportunity to do work in the public sector and in, in the private sector. But the, act, the Action Forum, mm -hmm. which was started in 71, two years prior to Maine, it mm -hmm. was the forum that they used to talk back and forth. And Bill Calloway and Mills B. Lane started that. Yeah, do you know what really prompted, because what really prompted that, they're, they're coming together? It, 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 I think it was prompted by the MARTA referendum, which mm -hmm. failed mm -hmm. uh, the first time. And, uh, and so the white power structure was interested in having this train transit. Uh, and, and, and it didn't do well in the minority communities. And so mm -hmm. they started meeting mm -hmm. to talk about how they could get this referendum passed a second time. And there was a lot of bar bargaining going on back and forth. And finally, on the second referendum, it did pass in Atlanta, in the city of Atlanta, in DeKalb, uh, mm -hmm. DeKalb County. Mm -hmm. And out of that, um, uh, and they also had school desegregation going on at that particular time in Atlanta Public School. And so they found this to be a convenient way to sit down and talk and, and to get these things worked out. Because one of the, the big data points, uh, I thought, was not only do we have enlightened political leadership, people like uh, uh, Ivan Allen and, and William Hartsfield, mm -hmm. but we also had an enlightened white business community, Coca-Cola in particular, and, mm -hmm. and Delta Airlines, who saw the benefit of, 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 of Atlanta being uh, a leader. And we could have very easily been another Birmingham and Nashville. Mm -hmm. We were all about the same size at that time. But mm -hmm. um, Coke and, and Delta in particular, I thought, uh, had begun to become international. And they were, well, at least Coca-Cola, maybe not Delta. And, and they were very concerned about the image, their, their corporate image, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And of course, Mr. Woodruff, who was the most generous benefactor that we've ever yeah. uh, known uh, in the city. Yeah, what was your impression? You met him personally, did you? Mr. Woodruff? Mr. Woodruff? Oh, no. Yeah. No. I just, I saw there was a picture of him with Maynard, so I didn't know. If yes, he... yeah. When, when I was growing up, he was in his 80s and 90s, and he mm -hmm. had uh, become retired. The mm -hmm. CEO at uh, Coke at that time was a man by the name of J. Paul Alston, mm -hmm. who... I did meet mm -hmm. and uh, knew all of the other Coke presidents since mm -hmm. him, but uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Woodruff was up in his 80s and mm -hmm. was not. What was uh, J. Paul Austin like? <clears throat> he was very reserved, uh, not gregarious, uh, not very outgoing, uh, but, um, you know, a very solid, you know, methodical uh, business uh, person. And mm -hmm. uh, it was really not until uh, Roberto Gosueta uh, became CEO mm -hmm. in the 80s that Coca-Cola really took off uh, both on an international basis and just on all cylinders and uh, they had fabulous growth in the 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. uh, up until his death in 1990 I think it was after the Olympics mm -hmm. 96, 97 mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you think the board ended up appointing him? That was an interesting Well, it was Mr. Go Mr. Uh, Woodruff's decision, final mm -hmm. decision, as, mm -hmm. as every decision, major decision that Coca-Cola was. Mm -hmm. And there were three or four candidates. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Gus what at that time was um, was an ethnic minority. Right. And so it was highly, highly unusual yeah. for Coca or anybody else in the South to have an uh, ethnic uh, minority. But Woodruff 
Mr. Woodruff saw in him, and I'm just repeating this secondhand, mm -hmm. saw in him just a uh, opportunity to transform the company, and uh, his instincts were correct, and um, Roberto was just a very dynamic, he was very uh, gracious and outgoing, and uh, just a very dynamic man. He originally was from Cuba. Mm -hmm. And did he put into place a lot of the more minority business development aspects of Coca-Cola, or did that precede him? No, it, it came during his era. Uh, and he had a co-presidency, Andre. I don't know if that's the right way. His title was chairman and CEO, and then he had a president whose name was... Um, Oh my gracious, I can see him. Uh, but in any event, this is when uh, Jesse Jackson negotiated the business development plan uh, mm -hmm. with the president of Coca-Cola. It was unprecedented. It was the first, obviously, mm -hmm. in, definitely in Atlanta, but maybe in the country, mm -hmm. where they had a stated goal of uh, doing business with uh, with minority firms. And uh, in fact, my firm at that time, uh, Donald Ramey Company, was contracted, we were the first professional services firm to be contracted by Coca-Cola to uh, work with them in that particular area. Hmm. And yeah. that was negotiated with Jesse? Jesse Jackson and the president of Coca-Cola, his, his, his name was uh, Don, Don, Don Keogh. Keogh. Don Keogh, who is a legend. Uh, Don Keogh was, in fact, he's still on the Coke board, mm -hmm. but he was the one that negotiated the uh, transaction with Jesse Jackson because they had threatened to uh, boycott mm -hmm. uh, Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. So what, do, did they have like a target? What was their... <clears throat> it, 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 to answer your question, no. There, there, were, there were no quantitative goals, yeah. but it was a commitment and spirit. Yeah. And uh, Coke did a fabulous job and they set the precedent uh, for other corporations, not only in the Atlanta area, but throughout the country. That, mm -hmm. that was a model, that became a model mm -hmm. for corporate America to involve minority contracting and so forth and so on. They'd already been doing it in the federal government. Perrin Mitchell, who was a, a mm -hmm. contemporary of your father's in Congress, uh, was the author of the first legislation back in the 70s to get the federal government involved in minority business or procurement and the Coke transaction in the 80s, 10 years later, was, was that, it might not be the first, but it was certainly one of the better known uh, mm -hmm. in, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So is that, so um, it was kind of taking what had been done in the public sector that Maynard had done and so forth. Exactly, exactly. The federal government had, had started it in the early 70s, uh, Maynard put it in place here in, in, in the late 70s. And then the private sector started it in the early 80s. And so you, you have the opportunity as a, as a black business person to do business now, you know, all over the, uh, you, you're not limited to just Auburn Avenue. I mean, you can do business uh, all over. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, I thought that was a turning point. Mm -hmm. the, and you have been in the um, Small Business Administration. I was in the Small Business Administration doing the Carter Administration by virtue of being recommended by Jesse Hill and Andrew Young. And um, um, uh, Jesse suggested it, and then uh, Andy was the one that had the contacts, and he wrote a very, uh, he exaggerated, I tell him all the time, but he wrote a very nice letter, and, and I was, I got appointed to that position, uh, and, and, and that was in 1976. Yeah. What do you think Jimmy Carter's presidency meant for Atlanta? Well, I, I wasn't here during that time, but it had to be um, a but source I mean, of yeah, I mean, I source just, of pride. And and when you went around and you told people from Atlanta, they just assumed that you that you and Jimmy Carter were boys, you know, <laughs> you, know you know, that y'all hung out together. But uh, there was a small group. It was a pretty big group from Atlanta, you know, Hamilton, Jordan, and um, you know, other people like that. And so it it, it was. It was a pretty heady time to be in Washington, in, in the Carter administration, and be with the president who was from Atlanta and you from Atlanta, so mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. When did you move back to Atlanta? Well, I stayed five years. I stayed four years plus one, and then I came back uh, because of the Coca-Cola contract. They, uh, I had just uh, finished my stint with the SBA and Carter lost in 81, and that was right around the time they were negotiating in Carl Ware. Uh, at that time, was with Coca Cola. He was their community vice president for outreach, and uh, he uh, recommended me to Don Keogh. And um, and uh, I, I had just set up a firm. I'd had it maybe a year, and that was my first big big contract. And we worked with him three years. Mm -hmm. 
And so what what did you do? What was your scope of work? Or? Well, the scope of work uh, revolved around identifying the needs of uh, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. uh, understanding what their commitment was, and then going out nationally and identifying uh, minority firms that could uh, participate in the uh, Coca-Cola system. I gave you two examples. One was that uh, I was able to negotiate a banking deal where uh, Coca-Cola uh, allowed several uh, minority banks uh, or put in their uh, in, in these banks a hundred thousand dollars because that was the amount that was insured by the FDIC. Mm -hmm. uh, there were several suppliers, uh, you know, just of, of, of goods and services, and uh, even though I was not involved in the deal, uh, Julius Irvin and uh, by the name of a man by the name of Bruce Llewellyn mm -hmm. bought the first uh, Coca-Cola franchise up in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and that was an outgrowth of that commitment by Coca-Cola to involve mm -hmm. uh, minorities in their uh, bottling system. Mm -hmm. And then they made a fortune when they bought it back? Yes, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yes, yes, they did well. They did well. Yeah. Did yeah. well. Good. So why you, why'd you decide to come to Morehouse? We'll go back. Well, my grandfather went to Morehouse, and um, I just was a huge fan of his, and and I wanted to come back to Atlanta because we, we were always here every summer. And I just mm -hmm. think Atlanta was the beginning and the end. And mm -hmm. so when I had the opportunity to go to Morehouse, my father wanted me to go to a different school. Mm -hmm. But when I got a chance to go to Morehouse, I mean, that was uh, it hands down. Mm -hmm. Who was president? Benjamin Mays. Okay. He, he was the consummate, ultimate right. Morehouse man, the quintessential Morehouse man. Right. And uh, I still can remember him today. You were talking about mentors and people yeah. like that. Uh, you know, as a young young male coming up. I mean, he was just a, a presence. Um, and anybody who went to Morehouse during those days uh, still remembers him as being, uh, you know, just a guiding principal. I mean, it was nothing fancy, just, you know, good, solid uh, kicking and, and, you know, blocking and, 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 and how to be a man. They used to teach you how to shake hands or how to open the door for a lady or look somebody in the eye. I mean, just, you know, just simple things like that. Go to chapel. Go to chapel. We had to go to chapel every day. Yeah. Every day. And uh, Dr. Mays would speak. He was a theologian. He was a uh, educator and a, and a theologian and just a very eloquent speaker. I mean, just very. And so you can imagine how a young student like uh, Martin Luther King, who grew up in that environment, could become such a an eloquent speaker. I mean, when you, when you listen to Benny, Benny Mays for four years, mm -hmm. uh, it just rubs off on everybody. Mm -hmm. And what was your major? Math and business. Mm -hmm. so, um, I was trying to think of the infamous math teacher. Who was the chair? Oh, uh, Dr. Dansby. Mm -hmm. Pops Dansby. Mm -hmm. You know him? I don't. I think I was maybe thinking of somebody else, but but he was there. Yeah, he was there early. See, you too young to remember him. Uh, <laughs> but Pops Dansby was was. I mean, he was just like a legend in more eyes around the math. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the fortune of being uh, being in this class. Yeah. So how ma how did you get to math? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I did you know fairly well in high school and and um, you know did well enough to get uh, you know get out of Morehouse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So were the student sit-ins going on? When oh you yeah. Were Morehouse? Oh yeah. Lonnie King, mm -hmm. uh, Julian Bond. Mm -hmm. We're all seniors uh, when we got there that first year in uh, 61. Mm -hmm. And uh, it so happened that um, they started in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. uh, and Durham was the second city. And I, it might have been the third or fourth, but mm -hmm. but it, it was. And so uh, it, it was just kind of a cool thing to do to go downtown then and, and to sit in uh, with the college students. And then when we came to uh, Atlanta that fall, so that was in 1961, mm -hmm. uh, 1960 rather, uh, that... Um, and, and one of the people, there's a picture of him, one of the people who was out on the picking line at, uh, at Rich's was my grandfather. I mean, he was in his late, right. late 70s, but mm -hmm. he was out on the picking line too. Yeah. Was there a feeling of fear though? You said it was a cool thing to do, but. Well, you know, we were all, you were young, you know, I was your age, you know, I mean, you don't think about the ramifications of mm -hmm. what you were doing then. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, it was almost as much social as it was having a, a political conscience, and all the, the girls from Spelman went, so you went too. You know? <laughs> I mean, it was that simple, you know. You know. <clears throat> what? Uh, so you, but you did it first as a high school student. Yes, yeah, a high school student in Durham. Mm -hmm. We we uh, we were the second city 
right after Greensboro mm-hmm. to uh, uh, go down to Woolworths. We had a Woolworths in Durham. I'll never forget it. And um, it, you know, it, it was it was very interesting. But it was more. It, it, it by the time we got to Atlanta, I mean, it was much more organized, and uh, because the stakes were bigger, and they were, uh, you know, the, these seniors like Lonnie King and, and Julian, who were, you know, really getting it getting it organized. Mm-hmm. So what was your impression of them as a, you were like a freshman? I was a freshman. I, I you know, they didn't know me and I just, you know, <laughs> yeah. once again, I mean, I, it, it was, I mean, I, I have to be honest with you, man, it was not a big social conscious type thing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we're not here trying to free the people. Mm-hmm. It was the thing to do as a freshman and mm-hmm. uh, Morehouse was behind it. They, they uh, didn't penalize you if you, um, you know, missed a class or what have you. I mean. Mm-hmm. The leadership in Morehouse was was embraced it. Hmm. So you I could, was just a freshman, yeah. So you could like, I mean, if it was a choice between going to class and going to the picket line, it was okay to go to the picket. Well, line? Well, no, I don't want to say that. Now. That's that's <laughs> not that's not that's not entirely okay. correct. Okay. But on occasion, you know, when we did go, we went, uh, you know, several times consec- consecutively. Um, you did miss class. Mm-hmm. You did miss class, but there was no um, presumption. There was no. Um, Excuses because mm-hmm. you uh, were not in class. I mean, mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. did you um, did you go to jail? No, I did not. Yeah, when I was at Emory, um, Genesis Six was going on. Yes, and actually, that was the same thing. Um, the Emory professors did not uh, penalize anybody that didn't come to class that week because they were involved in that. Yeah. It just made me think of that. Yeah. Did you go? No, I wasn't able to. It was, um, I think, T.I. had gotten a, um, oh, a big van, and yeah. you had to sign up, and it, not everybody could go. I but I, was, I went to the rally on campus, but I wasn't able to actually go down. Yeah. Limited space. <laughs> yeah. So did you ever get to march with your grandfather? No, I did not. Uh, but I was with the group. I was not uh, there the day that they took that particular picture. He was mm-hmm. not in good good health, yeah. and it was the day that he went that they captured. The, yeah. They took a picture of. But uh, I was down on other on other occasions. But yeah. I, I wish now, in retrospect, that I could have had a picture captured captured that moment. Uh, yeah. But they do have one of him. Yeah. 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 What was so? I mean, what was the what was the feeling about? Segregation, you know, the sort of growing up as a, um, you know, from a well educated, I mean, a family that's so well educated that has so many gifts and, you know, and, and is, but to still be subjected to that. Well, to be very honest, I mean, it was like a way of life. I mean, I know you couldn't, you know, my daughter, my 20 year old can't can't visualize this now, but if you grew up like that, I, mean, I was 21 years old, 20, 21 years old, before I actually had uh, a serious interaction with uh, whites, and I was a junior at Morehouse, so I went to uh, work in New York for one summer, mm-hmm. and um, up until that time, I had very, very limited interaction with, with white people, and, mm-hmm. and uh, we, we just accepted our way of life as, a, mm-hmm. as, as the way of life. Mm-hmm. And the, I mean, part of the thing of, was also your family was in a position to, to protect you from some of the worst in, encounters. With well, that's a good working. point, yes. Yeah. And, um, so you attended segregated public schools? Oh, yes, in, um, yeah, in Durham? public schools. You didn't uh, go to um, we'd not, No, we, they, we were not allowed, we didn't go to the movie theaters because they were segregated and, uh, yeah. you know, my, uh, my uh, parents did not allow us to go into segregated uh, facilities. So that was so they had they had rules about that. Oh yes, yes. I mean, you couldn't go into you know the back door or whatever. I can't even remember the name of the theater, mm-hmm. uh, but you had to go in the back door and all that kind of stuff. They never allowed us to uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. So when Do- when Dr. May said that he wouldn't go to the balcony of the Fox if it were to hear Jesus Christ Himself. Yeah, he, he said something like that. <laughs> he, I mean, you know, that, that, that whole trend continued all the way through uh, Morehouse. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just, you, you were just, you know, you, were, you, you didn't feel second class. Mm-hmm. Even though there was mm-hmm. segregation there, mm-hmm. you know, you, you didn't feel sec- uh, second class because uh, Benny Mays would make you feel like you were 
uh, on top of the uh, on top of the world. I mean, he could just you know make you feel good about yourself and uh, or about your status as a as a young black uh, black male. And so I was there four years. And he was uh, uh, my president for four years. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting the um, the dynamic. Of course, you know, my mother was the same way. She would let us um, she would let us go downtown with other people, but she would never take us to any of those segregated um, kinds of things and you know riches and all that where you had to go in the basement and couldn't trunk. She wouldn't. No. She would and, and in her hometown of Marion, you know, we had the same. Yes. You know, we could we didn't go to the movie theater because it was only the balcony. Yes. And that kind of thing. Yeah. And and, 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 and most of the uh, Morris guys when they got out, I mean they did well in you know, in environments where they had to compete because they felt that they were, you know, as good as anybody. I mean just did not have a second class mental uh, mentality. Mm -hmm. And so when you're out in the marketplace competing, mm -hmm. you, you compete with anybody. What do you? I mean, so what do you think were some of the ingredients of that of not of not you know how you keep people from developing a second class mentality even in this terrible situation? Well, you you had first of all we had you know a couple of role models you know we had the people who had gone through Morehouse and at that that particular time Morehouse was producing you know more PhDs and MDs than any other. Uh, you know, a black school in the uh, country, and so they would always bring back mm -hmm. uh, as role models uh, people to to show you what could be done. Mm -hmm. And then he talked about it as a, uh, you know, he he, he would say the the, the the failure in life is is not to reach your goal, but the failure in life is not to have a goal. Mm -hmm. And so he would always have us to uh, aim for this and that. Uh, which in some cases may be unrealistic, but he said at least have a goal, and if you don't make it, then that's all right. But you can't mm -hmm. just go around here without having a goal in life. Mm -hmm. So, what was your goal? <laughs> to get out of Morehouse. <laughs> 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 you know, to get. Well, at, at that time, um, I was still in math, and uh, you know, my father had influenced me to think that I might be an actuary, mm -hmm. which is a mathematician, mm -hmm. which is what Jesse Hill was, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah. I just uh, didn't. I didn't like math that much, mm -hmm. and um, and it takes you know you have to be kind of a nerdy, mm -hmm. uh, nerdy kind of a person. So uh, I was able to get a different kind of job, and that just put me on a different track. And uh, it was late when I circled back to insurance because uh, I was in my fifties before I got associated with uh, Atlanta Life. But my father's plan was for me to come back to Durham and to work in North Carolina Mutual. That was his. Uh, mm -hmm. That was his goal. Did you go straight to Wharton from? No, to I ask. took a. Yeah, I went to uh, the University of Michigan uh, in computer sciences. I mean, that was something that I really enjoyed, and then get back in until later, um, and then. Uh, I got accepted to a Wharton because they don't take you right out of school. They mm -hmm. they like for you to work a couple of years, and so uh, I, I thought that was a better. A lot of people said that was a better career path. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the relationship between Atlanta and University of Michigan? Because it seemed like so many people had. I mean, Horace Ward and Jesse Hill, and you just had a bunch. Of, uh, it, it was a, just a very liberal. It was large, mm -hmm. and, and it was very liberal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a lot of blacks there, and they were one of the early schools. You, you also may remember, uh, you, you, both of y'all too early, but most of the black athletes left the South and went to play for Michigan and Ohio State and Illinois. Mm -hmm. And so there was always a large core black population in those schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was not unusual for you to be there as a student. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was not an overwhelming you know, group, but you know, I didn't feel like, you know, I was the only one there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it stemmed from the athletics. And how many blacks were there when you got to Wharton? Well, very few. Mm -hmm. You know, Pennsylvania was not a, uh, you know, it's, it's an Ivy League school and, and, and they don't focus on athletics. And um, But most of the Big Ten schools, Minnesota, mm -hmm. Ohio State, Illinois, I mean, all had huge uh, black athletes and, mm -hmm. and good athletic programs. Mm -hmm. You told some really great stories about um, <laughs> David Franklin and how you and how you uh, all teamed up. And uh, so, what what was your now? 
you were in Atlanta when Maynard decided to run against Talmadge? No. No. No, I had not come back. Uh, but when I was in college, Maynard came by our dormitory, and I introduced him to David Franklin. David mm-hmm. just happened to be there. He was always in my room. He spent mm-hmm. more time in my room because he was a day student. Mm-hmm. And so and so they were just so impressed with Maynard. He had a car, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, he was very... You know, and so you know, David. I mean, uh, Maynard didn't rem- uh, remember meeting uh, David, but but that was you know. And so, uh, fast forward to uh, 1970. Where are my notes? Here? Get these dates. He, he ran against Herman Talmadge in '68, mm-hmm. and I came to Atlanta in 19. Came back to Atlanta in 19. Um, 71 mm-hmm. and um, he, he, he he had run right after 68 he ran the next year for vice mayor right. and ran I mean and won mm-hmm. and uh, you know it was presumed that uh, Leroy Johnson was going to be the next mayor or the, the, the black to run mm-hmm. at the right time mm-hmm. and Maynard preempted him and there was a lot of resistance uh, Andrea in the black uh, community uh, when I say the black community the, the power structure mm-hmm. Jesse and Herman mm-hmm. to call out some names mm-hmm. thought that, that Maynard was he was only 36 that mm-hmm. you know he ought to wait and you know they, 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 they really were, were going to back Leroy Johnson but um, uh, it turns out that the polls and and just the pulse and, and the momentum and the, and the, the way that he had run against Talmadge and had done you know great in those four years as vice mayor, that that he was a better prospect to win than Senator Leroy Johnson. And so one of the things that David Franklin did, um, and he and I paid for it, was to get a poll. Mm-hmm. Uh, David was very politically inclined. And the poll showed that Maynard could win the mayor's race in Atlanta. I mean, it was unheard of. And uh, Jesse took it, uh, took those uh, uh, results back to the Action Forum. This mm-hmm. is seven, eight years into the Atlanta Action Forum, mm-hmm. and the white business leaders couldn't believe it. I mean, they mm-hmm. they didn't think that this was uh, possible, and none of them supported Maynard. I mean, mm-hmm. not a single uh, single one. We had uh, Charlotte Ottermilk, who was a big you know supporter of your dad. Mm-hmm. But uh, when Maynard ran, um, it, it was a pure political muscle of getting out the vote, and he got 90 some odd percent of the black vote, and there was a lot of black votes cast uh, for him, and, and obviously some, you know, some white uh, votes. Mm-hmm. But the story with David was that uh, Maynard had a very close friend whose name was uh, Chuck Williams, mm-hmm. who went to Morehouse, mm-hmm. and uh, David had come back to Atlanta by that time and had joined Maynard's law firm as an associate. And he was a political junkie. Uh, Chuck Williams was a political junkie, and here's Maynard. And uh, Maynard brought me in to be the treasurer, <laughs> you know, the bag man. And so we met for, uh, you know, for a year even before he announced. And Chuck Williams, who I thought was brilliant. I mean, Main, I mean, David was brilliant too. But but Chuck was the one that wrote the papers, the white papers, and you know, did the statistics, you know, did all of the that that kind of work uh, around the election. And uh, we had put up, uh, David and I put up some initial funds, and then finally we got Herman and Jesse to, com- to commit to be in this camp. And so to Jesse's credit, uh, he became the chair of the campaign, and Herman Russell was the chair of the finance committee. And that's how I got to know Herman. I was a treasurer and worked directly with uh, Herman and uh, indirectly with, uh, with, uh, with Jesse and, and those relationships continue through today. I, in fact, I called Jesse's uh, house last week just mm-hmm. to talk to his wife. And... Yeah. yeah. Well, we were, I want to get to, to Jesse at some because I think he's one of the people who's always behind the scenes. Oh, he was he was a real deal. But anyway, to get yeah. get to, to yeah. the story about yeah. David. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is this this is my first campaign. I think this is everybody's first <laughs> campaign, and right. so. You know, there was this concept of you had to pay people to come to the polls. <laughs> you know, you just and it was kind of foreign to me. And, and so Davis told me, uh, he said, he said, uh, he said, Bill, we, we we gotta we gotta have a lot of cash on it. We gotta have some walking around money. I said, what? I said, what is this? He said, walking around money. And so it was just uh, foreign to me to write a big check to cash. And to have all this money just floating around, but but that's what you had to do, and you know we got to talk to Maine about it, and so it it it, uh, it, it 
but that's the way you work you work the campaign is mm -hmm. i mean you know that your daddy knows this you have to pay people in cash on election day to come out and do the polls and take people to the mm -hmm. polling places and all and and that's what we did to to make sure that uh, black folks got to the polls to vote mm -hmm. so what were the white what so chuck williams was doing the white papers was that the policy the policies mm -hmm. he was a policy guy you know and and uh you know what were the issues facing atlanta and, mm -hmm. and what could mean it how could mainly get up to speed on mm -hmm. Things such as crime and education, obviously, mm -hmm. was a big, mm -hmm. uh, big issue during that time. And he, he did the policy statements, and David did a little strategy, and, and was very big on the fundraising. He brought uh, Roberta Flack. Uh, he had to do a big concert uh, for Maynard, um, uh, which raised a lot of money, yeah. a lot of money, for, and a lot of visibility, and a lot of visibility for the campaign, yeah. a lot of visibility for the campaign, and so. I mean, that was had to be the most exciting year, you know, just, I mean, we were on a high, mm -hmm. you know, just on a high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that sort of started the, um, I mean, sort of Atlanta being kind of this entertainment south that seems like we started, you know, we had Roberta Black and Donnie Hathaway. Donnie Hathaway. Hathaway. Yeah. Well, David was right in the vanguard of that. Yeah. You know, this new wave, now it's hip hop, but, mm -hmm. but David was at the vanguard of, uh, black entertainment, even though they didn't live in Atlanta, I think a lot of the entertainers not live here. Mm -hmm. The hip hop crowd live in Atlanta, mm -hmm. but at that time, uh, Roberta lived somewhere in Washington, I think, and and uh, and uh, uh, Danny, uh, uh, Donna Hathaway lived up in Chicago and mm -hmm. and uh, different different places. But David was the entertainment lawyer for uh, the stars, and he was based in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so, any um, any good stories from that campaign? Uh, that that was the most that was the one I jotted down right. about, uh, about the walking right. around. Right. You know, there were a lot of other you know little uh, you know funny things, but not anything like the walk around money. That I remember that forty years later because <laughs> <laughs> it went against all of your principles, right? Yes, they're gonna bring me receipts. They're gonna bring money? me a receipt. They, do I get a receipt for this? You know? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Reverend Bennett used to call it sugar. Sugar. So That's what he called. Said we need a little sugar. Sugar. Mm. Well, that was that was the beginning of that, and I, I guess they still use it today. I'm sure that the Shirley and Casino and all of I mean, you have to pay. Yeah, you have uh, to be a little more circumspect about it now. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. And I, I know as an attorney, you 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 would uh, advise them not to do that. Well, it's uh, well, I think it's a double standard because I think you know they don't care how much money you spend on television. But this is just as legit. I mean, the people are driving folk to the polls and all that. I think I remember an election day where I said, it's not a chicken left in Atlanta. Because <laughs> <laughs> one of the things you would do is put a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken in the car. Yes. <laughs> when you're saying, you need a ride to the polls. Yes, and, yes. You know, you get you a chicken sandwich and a Coke and... <laughs> Boom. And you know, um, and those flatbed trucks, trucks. You know that why why they always expect poor people to volunteer, and the folks who make commercials and the TV stations and all that they're not volunteering. No. You know no. they get paid. They get paid for their time. So, yeah, so I, you have to give them a little something. Yeah. So I think a little sugar. Rub that. You need a little sugar. I remember him. Sugar. Yeah, rub that. He was something yeah. else. Okay, so what was it? Uh, but you didn't go into the administration. When Mayor was mayor. Oh no, I was. Well, what happened was uh, I was in the brokerage business. I was with Robinson Humphrey, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I got to know Herman. And uh, Herman said, uh, "You need to come work for me." Mm -hmm. And he was the majority shell of the Citizen Trust Bank. So I didn't go into administration. I went to work for uh, Citizen Trust Bank, mm -hmm. and uh, was there seven years maybe mm -hmm. uh, until Carter ran, mm -hmm. and um, then I left there to go to Washington. Mm -hmm. So was Herman a majority shareholder at that point? Oh yeah. Business trust? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He he had already accumulated his position. He was a majority shareholder. It might have been forty percent, as much as forty percent. Mm -hmm. uh, did I say majority? Mm -hmm. Well, he was the, the largest, largest, the largest right. single. Uh, I don't think he's ever been a majority, mm -hmm. but he was the largest sh single shareholder. Mm -hmm. And was the chairman of the board and mm -hmm. and um, you know called some most of the shots. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And um, what were so the, the the sort of whole joint venture strategy with um, Maynard took a lot of heat for that. Oh man, oh man! And one of the stories I was going to tell you well, here's another story. 
that and, and this this took place in many venues but one of them was the action forum and they just could not uh, get their heads around this and they told me that there were no qualified firms that this was extortion and so on and so on and I was in a room for this he, 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 he looked around he says grass will grow hmm. He said, we're going to do the right thing mm. and that we're going to have economic participation and we have mm. qualified minority firms to do uh, work on this and that uh, unless this is a guiding principle uh, on these contracts, he said, I'm not going to approve it. He said, I am the mayor. He told Billy Stern that who was the uh, president of a uh, trust company of uh, Georgia at that particular time. And I mean, he said this many times, but I, I remember this, you know, because I mean, he was just dead serious mm. about uh, he was not going to move ahead on that. Mm -hmm. Well, he held it up for a year. He held it up a long time. And he, he said, I hold it up long. He said, grass will grow and there will be no airport. Mm -hmm. uh, he also infuriated them, uh, as you may remember, uh, about uh, integrating that bank board. So he had all of this city money mm -hmm. and not a single um, uh, bank had a black and then that's how Jesse Hill got on Sun Trust, a trust company, Georgia mm -hmm. uh, board mm -hmm. uh, early on. Because, see, he was in these meetings and, and they knew him and got to know him. And mm -hmm. so Sun Trust was, well, that's name was called Trust Company, Georgia. It was one of the first banks to put a black on it, and it was Jesse Hill. That was Coca Cola Bank. That was Coca Cola's bank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, Ingrid has a great story about that. She said she was. In the room, when uh, he told him to, 24 hours, and I'm going to Birmingham. Well, he's going to move. The, he's going to move the money out of the Atlanta banks. They could not believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they had a, they had a nice old. I mean, no one really talks about the kind of old boy system that they yeah. had going. Yes, and that that's what that's what he had the audacity to challenge. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You, um, you know, what? Um, there was, um, let's see, there was a joint venture, the air, the, and, and the location of the airport, because that was controversial even, keeping the airport in South Atlanta. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. but the land was there, and mm -hmm. they, the only other spot was in Paulding County, which was, I mean, that's just too far away, and so the city owned this land. I mean, it was, I forgot what the acreage was, mm -hmm. and it was the ideal location. It was not too far, and uh, but but uh, no dirt turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how how did the um, now uh, oh the whole Reggie Eves thing because now Reggie was were did you know Reggie? Oh yeah. From Morehouse. Oh, yeah. From the oh yeah. House? Yeah. yeah. That that meeting was at yeah. my house when okay. he got uh, terminated. Mm -hmm. yeah. On Veltri. So what was uh, I mean how hard was that? Well, it was very difficult for Maynard because uh, Reggie was a classmate. Mm -hmm. They finished more than 57, 50, mm -hmm. I can't remember what, what it, mm -hmm. whatever it was, and uh, Reggie was very de devoted to Maynard, and mm -hmm. Maynard was a loyalty, a, a loyalty type of person. Mm -hmm. But it came to the point where, you know, and so uh, we had it off, you know, um, we just had it at my house. The main was there. David Franklin was there, mm -hmm. and some other people. Not a lot. And and, and Reggie Main, and uh, that's where uh, Main told Reggie uh, that he was going to have to step down. Because mm -hmm. it had been. I mean, this police issue had been a long issue in Atlanta. Been a long issue. And, and I mean, going back to your grandfather. Yeah, well, at that time they didn't have any black officers, and so we'd gone from that era to now where the police commissioner mm -hmm. was uh, was black mm -hmm. and uh, and then the scandal uh, came and um, and it just tarnished that whole that whole image and mm -hmm. so um, you know Reggie either knew about it or he condoned it but it certainly happened during his watch mm -hmm. and uh, so you know if you're wrong like that I mean you just have to you know just have to step down mm -hmm. so that was a tough that was a tough call because uh, and then after that I mean he and uh, made it just uh, you know, the friendship was gone. Yeah. I can remember, uh, we were actually talking to Austin Ford, um, who said that, I think it was Herbert Jenkins told him that when he, that in order to join the police department, when he came on, you had to join the Klan. Oh, my. You know, and I think sometimes there's not an appreciation of what a tough 
<laughs> environment, environment was, yes. you know, that you were dealing with. Yes. Um, that you had it. That that legacy of clan membership was so was such an important part of the wow. of the police department. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, and then um, the sort of I guess cleverness of creating the super chief. You yes. And they had one parking space, and both of them were trying to <laughs> park in one space and one park behind the other, so they couldn't get out. I mean, it really got, you know, really got down. I mean, it just. But I, I want to, you know, talk about the the Andrew Young administration mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, you asked asked mm -hmm. one here what was some of the key, mm -hmm. you know, points. So. Uh, you, you you go forward now to when Maynard uh, left and um, Andy uh, Young came. They 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 would not accept they being the white power structure would still not accept Andy oh. primarily because Maynard had endorsed him. I mean they thought that this was going to be a continuation and and uh, you know Andy was had had not uh, you know he'd been in, in been in Washington and and. Um, but Charlie Loudermilk was mm -hmm. was was the only. He, there may have been others, but he was certainly the biggest supporter of Andy from the uh, white uh, white power structure. But I thought that those uh, eight years were just very dramatic, and uh, you know his style was so much different from uh, Maynard's style, and uh, the whole focus on international. I'm not telling you things that you don't know, but this is one one mm -hmm. funny story. Mm -hmm. um, there was a uh, Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce meeting, mm -hmm. you know, like an annual meeting. They had it at uh, one of these big hotels and they had this big dais and all. And so the president got up and said, uh, he said, Mr. Mayor, he says, we understand that the people in Paris are taking a, a petition around saying that you're spending too much time in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> because he was always gone. You know, he was always gone and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, he took John Portman and Portman always said, he said, I got more what's the word, respect, the more entree, more access, you know, when I went to Andy one time that I'd ever gotten. and uh, But the, the rank and file just couldn't understand, I mean, they couldn't understand this whole international uh, thing. So I, I remember that uh, very uh, distinctly. But, but that led, in, in my mind, led to, uh, you know, obviously the next big event, which was the Olympics in, uh, in uh, 96. And I don't think that that would have happened uh, without... Um, uh, and having laid the groundwork, and then also, you know, being a person that uh, had the respect of the other countries around the world, and especially as you, I mean, you know, all this, the uh, African uh, uh, countries that voted in a, in a block. So that, that whole period was just a key period in, in making Atlanta, um, you know, the kind of international city that it is. And I, and I thought after the Olympics, I mean, a lot of money, additional new money came uh, into Atlanta. A lot of corporations uh, had Atlanta's southern headquarters, multinationals and southern headquarters, a lot of councils. Is that right? Co councils? A council that's mm -hmm. opened up uh, in Atlanta and just turned it into a, uh, a mechanized. So it's, it's just hard to believe <laughs> that in, in one lifetime that you could see this going from, uh, from just being a segregated uh, southern city to now, you know, uh, where, where I'm sure there's still racism and it's not as overt and um, if, if you can get up in the morning and go to work and, and, or work for yourself or work for somebody else, I mean, you can, you know, you can do things uh, uh, in Atlanta today. Mm -hmm. But it's just a, you know, it's a great city. So I, I'm interested in reading the book. I'd like to see it from his point of view because mm -hmm. he's got such a unique uh, perspective about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, you're, what were you doing what, when he was mayor? What was, were you with? I, I was with uh, Rob, I was with uh, Dobbs Ram and Company, mm -hmm. and uh, this is another uh, story that uh, I forgot to write this mm -hmm. down. But uh, when uh, uh, Andy came in, one of one of the few professional services contracts that had to be uh, let was what they called the financial advisor mm -hmm. for the city of Atlanta on all of its issuing of debt. And up until that time, Robinson Humphrey had an exclusive on that business. I mean, no mm -hmm. one, no minority firm had been uh, ever involved in mm -hmm. uh, financial advisory work. And I had worked at Robinson Humphrey uh, and knew some of the people there. But uh, I got a meeting with uh, with Mayor Young, and he got me into that particular contract, which was a turning point in my professional uh, career and uh, also in the development of uh, Dobbs Ramsey Company because we we had that was our first. 
entree into public finance and especially as a financial uh, financial advisor and I was just getting started mm -hmm. that was in 80 well I I just finished the, the, the co-contract um, so it was around 84 85 when mm -hmm. when he uh, uh, worked that out and then approved that in other words approved mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. But it's, it's the Atlanta way, you know, I mean, uh, they, they want to have a minority firm involved. Well, that's one of the things that he talks about is that the, the, the difference in the way Atlanta did minority participation and other cities was that the, the joint venture had to be all the way through. So if you're at the airport, you're not just cleaning the airport, you're designing the terminal. Yes. You know, you're laying the electrical, you're, you know, and that... And, and so you're doing the financial services, you're not just doing, you know, the, the less, um, uh, less lucrative and less skilled, you know, kind of work. So is that, would that, and that that was the thing, I mean, that was the brilliance of what Maynard really, could, his, the conceptualization of that. Exactly. I mean, he couldn't be in the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was unfortunate that right after he uh, talked about, or they approved the, the first joint venture out of the block, was a sham, mm. and, and the white and, and the white establishment, and especially AJC, was just all over it. I mean, they, they said, "Well, this this is not what we had." There were two guys that put together a joint venture. They had no employees, no license, no bonding, no place of business. They were just, you know, just there. Mm -hmm. But the term came to be a qualified uh, minority business brand. I think that's what you're talking about. People who had backgrounds and capacity and ability to do it, and was were using this as a way to build uh, a business. Uh, just not to get a quick dollar and to, and to put it in your pocket and, and to go. So is that when he put in place certification? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because the very first, the, I, I remember this, the very first joint venture was a sham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Out of the box mm -hmm. was a sham. And so that's when they put in the Office of Contract Compliance. You had to go to the certification process and you had to, you know, you had, they went out and looked to see if you were at your place of business, checked your bank records and who was authorized as a signature on the accounts. And, I mean, you had to be a legitimate uh, operation. Mm -hmm. And have some track record. In some case. track record. Mm -hmm. Some track record in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that set aside the Atlanta program from a lot of other programs uh, because you had people like Herman Russell who, who got on the airport. He's still at the airport mm -hmm. <laughs> for years. I mean, he's been there for years, but he got that start with made it. And, and when you've been on, on an account for 40, 50 years, I mean, you, 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 you can build a business. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think there are um, a lot of stories like that, you know, people who who had, um, I don't know, there's one story my dad tells about the somebody who got the paving for the um, runways or, the, you know, or maybe it was a parking lot, paving for the parking lot, and, you know, just kind of went on from there. Yes, you know? yes. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to, to get some of that documented. Uh, yeah. It's a good Georgia State project. Did you have a Did you have a question? Did, I actually was oh, going to ask okay. him about Andrew Young, but then oh. he he led into it without me having to even prompt. Yeah. Um, but just in general, I know you you kind of just said that um, it's hard to imagine in one lifetime seeing the major changes that Atlanta has gone through. If you had to choose maybe three or four turning points that you feel really changed Atlanta, what would you highlight? You mean in my lifetime or just in what what I yeah, read? Yeah, in your lifetime. Well, I wrote down here, you know, Coca-Cola <laughs> and, 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 and things like that. Um, uh, but that was before I, um, you know, came. I, I, I think, you know, I, I think Maynard's election was key. Uh, I, I think the whole concept of an enlightened business community uh, where you had not only elected officials like Ivan Allen and others, but the president of CNS Bank who saw that this was good for the economic development of Atlanta. And, and, and so they opened up. And, and so that happened in in the, my lifetime. I, I thought that the Atlanta Action Forum was a great infrastructure or conduit, a meeting place uh, for them. Um and uh, obviously the um, the Olympics 
Uh, I, I wrote down the and the, and the international vision, and then the 1996 Olympics, um, which 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 came and uh, and the other thing that I would think, Gene, is uh, I'm sorry, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gracious, what a slip! Um, I heard she looks like her. She does. She looks just like her mother. Um, um, was the the the, the proud succession of black males we have all have been high quality and, and I say this about Bill Campbell I mean he, he made one mistake and they threw him under the bus and, and jailed him 20 some odd months for but you know you know uh, Maine uh, and Bill Campbell you know Shirley and now Kasim Reed is doing a great job I mean you, you can't have another there's not another black city or there's another city that had the high caliber success of black males that we've had here in Atlanta. And in my lifetime, and just seeing that, and, uh, you know, they all reach back and, to pick, you know, Andy picked Shirley, and, and Shirley picked, and then Shirley picked Kasim. And, you know, they know what it takes to do that particular job, and um, hopefully we'll have that to continue. But that, that, that is a big thing in Atlanta to, to know that the, the highest elected official in your city is a, is a person of color. Now, I, do, I mentioned uh, Gene. I, I do have another Andy story. I want to tell you this is a little humorous. Um, I, I lived across the street uh, from the young, but I didn't know um, Andy because he, he used to travel a lot. And, and uh, so I just moved there. And it also happened to be in the time he ran, he was running for Congress. And so I had volunteered, I'd signed up and all. And so um, we were supposed to drive him um, one day. And so we went over to the house. And uh, Gene said, uh, are you looking for, uh, and I said, yeah, I'm supposed to drive him today. Well, he was not there. He was somewhere else. And so she was on the phone trying to tell, describe to him who I was. She says, this is, da, 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 he is Alice Washington's daughter, Patricia's new husband. Because <laughs> that's, you know, he was very fond of uh, Alice Washington. And uh, I always thought that was funny because people identified you with, you know, with uh, that kind of thing, but we lived across, uh, right across the street from them, and um, and the way that we got to be friends was that we played tennis. I was a big, big, big uh, tennis player. Oh yeah, and and uh, so uh, whenever Gene and Andy played doubles together, they knew that I was always available if they needed a fourth. They would have, they'd have a third person come in town and play tennis, and they needed a fourth, and they would always call me. I would be available, and we would. Uh, either go over to Walters, over to uh, uh, Washington Park to uh, to play, and that's how our uh, friendship uh, developed around uh, living across the street and playing uh, playing tennis together. And I was a big big fan of Jeans. Yeah. You know what what role do you think she played in um, sort of my dad's work in Atlanta? Well, I mean she she was very very stable. I mean very. Um, you know, level-headed, no nonsense, uh, and she may not have been out there, you know, uh, walking the picking line, but she 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 ran that house and uh, she kept kept those children, kept you all in 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 order, and and I, you know, I mean that that that's an important uh, factor to have stability in your home life. I mean, you out and then you come back. And you don't want a lot of turmoil in your house. You don't want a wife shouting at you and having discussions and all. That. You, you're not married, are you? No. Okay. Well, you you, you have a lot to look forward to <laughs> in, in, in the institution of marriage. And so, when you can find you. when you can find stability and, and tranquility and peace and and, and, a, and a, you know I, that, that just goes a long way, I think, for a, a male, any male. Do you remember the women for young when he ran for mayor? No. Okay. No, I think maybe Pat was involved in that. Yeah, but your mother yeah, hated she, that. She convened that actually for his second, um, for the congressional campaign that he won. Okay. And so now that's really a feature of everybody has a women's, you know. Oh, that started that. But she really started, she started that. that. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe uh, Anika's uh, mother, Pat, was yeah. was involved in that. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I think I think that she was. Um, what about Jesse Hill? You mentioned him a little bit. But, yes. You know, what are some of the things you saw him? Because you sort of, I guess, at different times were. Yeah. I, I was um, 
in my twenties when I first met Mr. Hill, and he was at that time the president of Atlanta Life. I mean, that was uh, you know big stuff at that time, mm -hmm. and um, he was very, very, very bright. I mean, just a very, very smart man, had high energy, and uh, he was famous for. Uh, coming a little late. If a meeting started at 2, I mean, he would come in maybe about 2.15, 2.20. He would get to just the meeting, and then he would be gone. <laughs> I mean, even they tell stories they had meetings at his house, and he'd be out somewhere and come back a little late and, and, and so on and so on. But uh, he took, he finally, he finally embraced Maynard and was the key, I thought was one of the key factors in getting Maynard uh, elected because he, he did act as a bridge between Maynard and the white business community and uh, they use once again this action forum uh, as a place to discuss uh, things and um, he personally benefited uh, from from this uh, the Sun Trust uh, Trust Company of uh, Georgia uh, president I mean a board seat uh, he got a lot of business from Delta and other corporations that did business with Atlanta life on group uh, group basis and so he was one of the few people that because he, he was in business that could um, uh, to do it and, and, and really turned out to be a, a you know a role model for uh, for me and then he reached out for me in the uh, 70s and brought me on the Atlanta Life board which is how I got involved in Atlanta Life and ended up being uh, uh, president there and, and uh, I was also involved in another organization called Opportunity Funding Corporation which is a nonprofit mm -hmm. that Jesse was the chair for many many years and I just got elected last year as a chair so there are a lot of paths that he has uh, um, gone ahead, and, and it's just helpful when you have a role model. I mean, somebody who has done it and, and that you look up to him, and, and uh, he and uh, Herman were those two for me. Mm -hmm. What is the Opp Opportunity Funding Corporation? It is based in, um, in uh, Washington. It's, it's uh, about putting capital uh, together for business transactions, uh, businesses that are owned and controlled by uh, minorities. Mm. And uh, they uh, have a lot of techniques and, and some capital, they don't have as much capital as they used to have, but they would actually invest in businesses and then uh, get paid uh, out mm. uh, when that was an exit strategy or you know, what have you. But it's, it, it started back in the 1970s when uh, Richard Nixon uh, mm. first came up with this black capitalism. Mm. 1970, whatever, the early, mm -hmm. early 70s. Right. Mm -hmm. But Jesse Hill was the first chairman of that organization and was the hmm. chair for 30, 30 some odd years. Wow. Yeah, Opportunity yeah. Funding Corporation. Yeah, I saw that on your. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, people don't really know about Nixon's black capitalism. He really started affirmative action. He did. He started it. He started it. He started it. The uh, Republicans uh, always thought that business was the way. To lift up, uh, you know, people who were oppressed and mm -hmm. to uh, make uh, economic equality a reality, mm -hmm. and uh, that was his thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he wasn't crooked, he he would go down as being a great uh, great president. Mm -hmm. But he just turned out to be, uh, you know, had this character flaw. All right. All right. Yeah. What um. And what about Atlanta Life? And the, I didn't. I, I wasn't thinking you had been on the board that long. Yeah, I was on the board twenty years. Yeah. From nineteen seventy two up until this year. Yeah. Uh, and when I got there, Andrea, it was still run the way that uh, Mr. Herndon, uh, Alonzo Herndon, Norris Herndon, and Jess had run, and that mm -hmm. was to sell barrel insurance. They call it home insurance. Mm -hmm. Well, that was all the way through the nineties, and that model. Um, just wasn't going to work. I mean, you can imagine uh, a, a black man or a woman dressed in, in, in ties and suits and skirts, you know, walking through uh, one of these neighborhoods with a satchel full of money. I mean, that just wasn't going to work uh, today. And so I, I was involved when the board made the decision, uh, and I was one of the uh, advocates for getting into financial services, getting out of home service, and getting into activities that would allow Atlanta Life to see a second 100 years. Mm -hmm. And today we have two uh, business subsidiaries. One is called it, uh, Herndon Capital Management, named after Her Nars mm -hmm. Herndon, I mean, Alonzo Herndon, mm -hmm. which has over $3 billion in assets under management. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we bought uh, Maynard's uh, investment banking firm, Jackson Securities, in, mm -hmm. in 2007, the year before the economy tanked. So that's mm -hmm. been uh, very, very difficult to mm -hmm. get 
to get a little traction on that. But um, I just had lunch. The reason I was late uh, with Bill Taggart, who's a new president, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. he was running late, and so I ended up running a little late. Mm -hmm. But Land Life is just a great, great story uh, started by an ex-slave, and and um, and uh, we would have had, I think, more millionaires coming out of Land Life if there had been a, a Herndon family member or the Herndon family could have kept the stock as opposed to him giving it to a trust mm -hmm. in 1950. It was a special purpose. I don't know if I'm using the right legal terms here, but it, it was a special purpose trust that was approved mm -hmm. by Congress just for this particular transaction, and they mm -hmm. put all of the stock um, in this uh, uh, trust called uh, the Norris and Da 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 Herndon Foundation, and they, they remain today as the majority shareholder. Mm -hmm. And, and so who governs that? Does well, they have a board of trustees. And so you have a board of trustees of the Herman Foundation, and then you have a separate board mm -hmm. of uh, Atlanta Life mm -hmm. uh, Financial Group. And your father was on the trustee board, for example, and then mm -hmm. there was another group of people who were on the uh, board of mm -hmm. um, uh, Atlanta Life Financial Group. And it uh, you know, just at times makes... For, for an awkward uh, governance. Uh, Did, uh, so Herndon didn't leave any heirs? No. Well, Norris Herndon, um, Alonzo Herndon, who was the father, had one son, mm -hmm. Norris. Norris never married. Hmm. And so when he died, he, hmm. he had all of this Atlanta livestock, and he put it in this trust. Hmm. Um, um, and that's where it hmm. is now, um, hmm. inside that trust. So the... Um, and. So that was part of the, the independence of Atlanta Life was that all of this money at that time came from these individual burial policies sold to black people. Exactly, exactly. You almost like the undertaker or the preacher. You, mm -hmm. you were independent from the white power structure because mm -hmm. your customer base and your revenues were coming from uh, sources. And then the white companies like MetLife and Prudential, mm -hmm. they, wouldn't write, they wouldn't write insurance on uh, black people. Mm -hmm. And it was only until the late... 60s, 70s, 80s, and then mm -hmm. the momentum really picked up, which is another reason to get out of that business, mm -hmm. uh, because they had, you know, just come in and mass and mm -hmm. had eroded the market that uh, Land Life and North Carolina Mutual and all had uh, mm -hmm. for years. In fact, Andre, I can remember uh, in my lifetime there were 62 black-owned life insurance companies in the country. Mm -hmm. Today it's about four. Hmm. And uh, three of them are in financial, well, two of them are in financial difficulty. One of them, Golden State, is in bankruptcy out in uh, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, Atlanta Life is still uh, still viable today. Mm -hmm. And what about North Carolina Mutual? They, they are in financial trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the, the, the market, I mean, it was a, it was a segre, you know, segregation right. worked both ways. And right. uh, it gave you a protection when nobody else wanted to come in. But when the white companies decided they were going to underwrite these uh, policies and, and write insurance on black lives, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it was very difficult for a black company to reverse that. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was instead of trying to sell, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, we then got into group insurance. Right. And so you could go to Coca-Cola right. and say, uh, you know, we'd like to be in the syndicate that's underwriting your group insurance. And mm -hmm. so we were able to get policies with uh, contracts with Coca-Cola and, mm -hmm. and Delta and Home Depot and, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other businesses around the country. But mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult for a black insurance company to sell a white person on buying insurance uh, on paper written on Atlanta Life or any other black right. insurance company. Right. And for and it is and did the did that market change? I mean, too that that people um, began to get life insurance more through their companies and not just through their individual. I mean, so even black people then began to have the kind of jobs where you had you got life insurance as part of your benefit pack. Very astute question. That 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 graph changed in two thousand and two. Up until that time, individuals bought individual contracts, but you could buy more insurance. Uh, the cost was uh, cheaper, and, and a lot of times the employer paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so people were buying insurance at the place that they work. And so it made more sense if you wanted to, to go after that business is to uh, write group mm -hmm. insurance as opposed to individual. And then the other thing that changed, uh, as you can imagine, uh, in, in the 90s, um, uh, people started buying, and you can buy it today, you, you can buy insurance 
uh, over the internet. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's much cheaper uh, right. policies and there's right. no overhead. And, right. and so that market slowly, you know, began to go away. Uh, and the number of agents, I mean, this is industry wide, just not right. uh, for black companies, but for all insurance companies, right. uh, the number of life insurance agents probably dropped by 50%. Because people mm-hmm. were seeking other uh, venue, other ways of buying and life insurance. This was in the nineties. Ni- Started that- in the nineties and accelerated right around ninety six when the internet uh, uh, became so popular. And oh. by two thousand, it oh. was the means for uh, you know buying insurance as well as anything else. Oh. And people just getting those term life policies. Exactly. You can get a term quote for dirt uh, yeah. online compared right. to what. Because if you bought it through an agent, you had to pay him or her a commission. Right, right. So you said two, two thousand two, the graph. And so what, what was it that changed? Well, if you charted group contracts versus individual contracts, uh-huh. uh, this line was was going up in this mm-hmm. line, but this line came down, and the group line overtook that. Mm-hmm. And so on a graph, and the reason I have it in my mind because we actually saw the graph. Uh, where that particular trend mm-hmm. was true to what the, we, we used uh, Pete Marwick to help us decide what to do, and that was their suggestion that group insurance was becoming the way to buy mm-hmm. uh, buy insurance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, but you know, I guess the 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 it's sort of the up and down side of, of uh, desegregation is that then you. You really, you still are back to the. I guess now you're back to the preachers and the undertakers who are, who are independent of the majority, culture, uh, culture that. And you can walk down Auburn Avenue. We started off at Auburn Avenue yeah. being so vibrant and stuff. Yeah. You know those businesses are gone now. Right. I mean, uh, the brokerage business, uh, the theater, the movie theater is gone. Uh, the Yates and Milton's pharmacies are closed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what else do they have on that street? I mean, the open air market uh, mm-hmm. is no longer uh, mm-hmm. there because uh, desegregation works both ways. I mean, it uh, it opens up new venues, and and, and and we are more inclined to go, you know, up to Phipps, up to you know, uh, Buckhead mm-hmm. to buy as opposed mm-hmm. to them coming out on Auburn Avenue to mm-hmm. uh, to buy. Mm-hmm. And so it just flipped the whole culture uh, upside down. Mm-hmm. Atlanta Life and Citizens Trust are still there. Atlanta Life and Citizens Trust are still uh, there. Mutual Federal uh, went under, Mm -hmm. and uh, Atlanta Citizens Trust bought their book of business. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they did not uh, make it. But SNLs uh, throughout the country, though, didn't make it. So that's not, um, you know, ethnic in particular. Well, and the same thing with individual um, drugstores. I mean, it's sort of this Soho kind of business model. yeah, it's it's hard to have an individual chain. You don't uh, have um, uh, BB Beeman's anymore. Yes, BB Beeman's was down there. Yeah. Yes, but, but you got all these black-owned McDonald's. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, I, I have I don't like to get it wrong, but was Brook and them have what TGR? Is it TGR Fridays? Yes, T- Tuesday. No, TGI Fridays. TGI Fridays. Yeah, they have a bunch of those. Yeah. Yeah, main it. Uh, Main has started there before he passed, mm-hmm. uh, and um, and to that credit, um, uh, they have a, a fellow by the name, you know, Dan Halper. Mm-hmm. He's really, really done a first class job on just growing that business. But Main got it started and, and got them in the right direction, and mm-hmm. uh, he didn't get to see it at this stage or this size, but it's done really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're. Um They've just made a big uh, pledge to the uh, Center for Civil Human Rights. Yeah, two hundred and was it two fifty yeah. or yeah, two fifty, and yeah. then a pledge to continue helping with other yes. minority businesses. And yeah. then, of course, Dan was so involved in helping Kasim. Oh, he was very key in helping Kasim. Yeah, yeah. So he's a new breed. I mean, I think that he's a new. You know, I see him and I see, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, see myself. You know, years early when we started off with uh, Maynard and, yeah. and, and uh, Bill uh, Bill Campbell working yeah. in their campaigns, but yeah. but Daniel now is probably uh, you know the key fundraiser for any uh, mm-hmm. candidate would that would want to run mm-hmm. uh, in the near future. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was sort of the whole thing. You know, when you go back to the um, you go back to the model, the partnership model that. You know the political. You know how the political influence continues to help the 
um, the economics. economic. Uh, and you know, try to grow that, kind of keep that going. Yeah, um, when, when, when the elected officials tell you you got to do certain things um, and then they call in the shots, I mean, you just have to, you know, either hear to them or he's going to pull the money out and put it in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, um, how did the uh, missing, I mean, the, unfortunately, um, the missing and murdered children's crisis will always be something associated with Mayor's time. Yeah. Mayor. It was tough. I was in Washington doing those last, and that was his second term. Yeah. And so uh, I, I was not here firsthand, but, but uh, Valerie uh, said it was just so tense mm -hmm. because I mean, he took it personally. I mean, he just, mm -hmm. um, and you couldn't get your hands around and you didn't know what was going on mm -hmm. and the press, and then it became national. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very, mm -hmm. very. Why did he take it personally? Well, he felt that Atlanta was his city then. You mm -hmm. know, this is his second term. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was happening on his watch. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of, I mean, Maynard had that kind of sense of oh, yeah. responsibility for the city. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he loved the airport. He thought the airport was his, you know. Uh -huh. um, uh, but uh, he, he um, just felt it, was, it happened during his watch and it damaged the city. And, and he was a spokesman for the city. And so... Uh, he, he just took it very personally and yes. it's the kind of thing where that spills over into your personal life and, mm -hmm. and I know from Valerie firsthand that uh, it was a very very difficult time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions that you have Teresa? Now I brought a couple of books I don't know oh, if good. Teresa if you if you uh, read the uh, or not but, but this is a book that uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Pomerantz uh, wrote and it's called Where Peace Free Meets uh, Sweet Auburn. And it's written uh, about two Atlanta families, the Allen family and the Dobbs family, both of whom um, produced the uh, mayors. Mm -hmm. And it's got a lot of history. Unfortunately, it stops in, uh, even before the Olympics. What do, you think about, um, what do you think about that book and the way your family is, is characterized in it? Um, well, we have found out subsequent to this that there are some um, factual uh, inconsistencies here mm -hmm. because when Gary wrote this back in the 80s I mean there mm -hmm. was no such thing as genealogy.com mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and all and uh, I, I tell you how this came out about uh, mm -hmm. is my daughter mm -hmm. um, had to do a research project at the University of North Carolina mm -hmm. and they have genealogy.com mm -hmm. they got a methodology for mm -hmm. doing this and mm -hmm. all and you can find out birth certificates mm -hmm. death certificates and she went all the way back to 1861 when mm -hmm. the census first included black people up mm -hmm. until that time black people were not included and so you could see who was property and, mm -hmm. and names and all and so there's some factual um, and, and, and he, he, he being Gary, mm -hmm. was basically going on oral history. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was oral history, but he mm -hmm. didn't have what they call primary source documents to determine right. who was the father and who right. would, you know, and how many. But right. she's gone back right. several, several, several generations to do this. Right. And then this is a book that uh, Bob Holmes wrote. I don't know if you, you mm -hmm. read this. You read mm -hmm. this too? Yes. Yeah, uh, wrote on Maynard. And um, uh, it's got a lot of detail in there about um, all of this. So. I looked at these quickly last night um, to make sure I had my dates. Mm -hmm. Let's see if they have a mm -hmm. picture. Of the thing I always, the thing that used to strike me about the this the where um, Petrie meets with Auburn is that he um, he calls the Allens aristocrats and he calls the Dobbs black aristocrats. Oh, I I missed that. <laughs> I, and I said, well, what? I mean, well, both of them walked off a farm and, it, it, you know, outside of Atlanta. So how did the Allens get to be aristocrats? And by that token, the Dobbs are also aristocrats. Now, here's a picture I told you about. That, that's yeah. that's uh, right in, in front of Riches yeah. during the uh, sit ins in the early 1960s. Yeah. Oh, it is 1960. Ten months before he died, he, he was not in good uh, good health, but uh, he was. So, mo so your family really cooperated a lot in a lot of the oral history came from. Oh yeah, from my you mother. All. My mother was kind of the contact person, and mm -hmm. uh, he had, uh, uh, and and there was some you know pictures and some mm -hmm. source documents, but mm -hmm. 
you know, once you got past two generations, three hundred generations, mm. I mean, you couldn't right. access death certificates, and now have been digitized, right. and you can right. find them online and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good thing. I ne- I always feel like it's it's unintentional that um, there's there's a little more, and it may be too. Well, it's I think it's unintentional, but there's there is. Um, it's still not quite equal, you know, the, the coverage. And that, um, you know, Maynard's administration was, um, you know, certainly as uh, rich and accomplished as much as uh, Ivan Allen's. I'm not quite sure that comes through in the, in the, uh, in the book. But it's a, you know, but it's yes. a good book. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's better to have it than not have it. Exactly. You and know? then, of course, uh, you know, I think one of main issues you were talking about, what, what are some of the defining, you know, I think that uh, even though uh, Ivan, I mean, uh, William Hartsfield built the first airport, it was uh, Maynard in 1980 that did this huge expansion out there now. And I think the airport has played as as important part as any politician or any other fact uh, mm-hmm. in defining Atlanta. Because people come to Atlanta, they can get anywhere in the world, 400 and some odd flights a day, 500 flights a day. And uh, people, especially for corporations that are relocate here, always cite the airport mm-hmm. as being one of the reasons for wanting to relocate. Relocate their corporate headquarters, or just people coming to Atlanta, yeah. is the accessibility of the airport. And then yeah. your dad, he he um, he he wanted to privatize it and sell it to uh, the Japanese. You remember that? <laughs> I you do. Know? And I man, do. they went up in arms about that. They they yeah. said, uh, Mr. Mayor, this, you know, but they 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 really. And that's when the state for, the state first started thinking about taking it back over. Uh, they were gonna take it from the city and make it a state authority. Right. And they still probably try. They still try. They would love to do it. Yeah. Well, because so much is, uh, so much income is, is general. So, did, I, mean, I mean, did Maynard really get that? I mean, does he really have that vision of what the expanded airport would mean for the region? I, I, I think... To be honest, I mean, it, it was on the drawing boards. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a capital uh, project they had mm-hmm. talked about for a while. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he had big vision, but I don't know if he ever envisioned it being what it is today and what the economic impact would be on Atlanta. He mm-hmm. might have. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I think af- after he got out of office, mm-hmm. he began to realize what a great uh, public uh, structure that it was. But mm-hmm. uh, it was just on a, a capital plan to um, to... Uh, Sam Marcel had it uh, to, to get done for the city. Mm-hmm. Who did that planning? Because you were on CAP or which which one of those? I was on uh, uh, Central Atlanta Progress, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 you know there were whole you know a lot of different organizations had lists of things to be done in order mm-hmm. to move forward, move mm-hmm. Atlanta forward. Mm-hmm. And so this had come from uh, CAP, the Central mm-hmm. Atlanta Progress, to. Mm-hmm. To expand this airport into mm-hmm. uh, not expand it, but move it to another location and to make it, mm-hmm. you know, bigger and all of that. And then your father came; he added to it. Shirley added to it. You know, everybody has built something. You know, a new terminal, mm-hmm. a new cargo, or something that has made the airport bigger and better. Mm-hmm. What um, did, is any of that different than are in other cities? Because I mean, the thing about I mean, CA Central Atlanta Progress is something that really does focus on. The central city, yes. not not on the metropolitan yes. area. I mean, is that something different for different about Atlanta, or do you see that in other? Cities? Well, you know, Central Atlanta Progress. I mean, they consider themselves to be almost a competitor to uh, the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, and mm-hmm. Atlanta Chamber of Commerce then became the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, and they took on you know more issues like transportation mm-hmm. and water. Mm-hmm. But C- Central Atlanta Progress at that time saw the airport as being in their domain, I and mean, it was kind of an extension of downtown. Mm-hmm. And um, um, but you take cities like up north. I mean, they haven't built. I mean, I don't think Newark or LaGuardia has been mm-hmm. substantially changed uh, mm-hmm. since William. What's the name of the mayor? Mm-hmm. Uh, LaGuardia, LaGuardia <laughs> uh, was there, and so um, they don't have anybody pushing them like they did here um, mm-hmm. uh, in Atlanta. And then the other key thing was that the land was available. I mean, the northeast is landlocked, and mm-hmm. all those big cities up north and northeast are landlocked. I mean, mm-hmm. they couldn't build a big airport like mm-hmm. that. So what about Dallas and Houston? 
Well, I think they are comers, mm -hmm. you know, because of the land. I mean, they have uh, they have uh, land. They're not landlocked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think, think they had the kind of visionary leadership that Atlanta's had? I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you, um, ha has there been a, a black mayor of Dallas? Mm -hmm. Well, Ron Kirk was oh, later. Oh, that's right. Ron, Ron Kirk was later. And, and he says, actually, he attributes, he says that um, he could not have been mayor of Dallas without Maynard, Maynard. and Daddy's record in Atlanta. He said that. I, I was a, I was here. Now, he's ambassador now mm -hmm. for the yeah. Office of Office and Trade. Yeah. I, heard, I heard him speak here, and he said that. Yeah, yeah. He said that that was something he showed. Yeah. You know, that, that, that helped, that the Atlanta's record was one that he had to use because there's, Still, that fear that somehow if you you know you get a black mayor, you're gonna end up looking like Newark. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and well, then that goes back to the point I tried to make earlier about our succession of of, of mayors who have all been just high quality, mm -hmm. you know, do something type mayors, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think you can find a track record like that in black or white mayors. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chicago had one mayor for all of, you know, right. umpteen, a hundred years. Yeah. But, um, you know, to have that quality of person to commit to public life and leadership is, is, is highly unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you think we, um, we haven't asked that we should have? <laughs> well... Well, I think um, I tried to jot down some things and, and a couple of speeches I've given by Maynard, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think you were right on uh, mm -hmm. on with the, with the questions, mm -hmm. uh, and and you're knowledgeable. I mean, more knowledgeable than I am about this, and certainly more knowledgeable than uh, uh, people living in Atlanta about what you know, you know, the Atlanta way and, and, and doing these things. And so, uh, it, it's it's interesting to talk. And had that kind of conversation. Oh, well, do you have any any speeches you could share with us about Maine? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Like that. That I think that would be, you know, um, because you know clearly the, um, I mean, the airport and the joint venture and the joint venture in particular is something that has, you know, really has global implications because if people, if you're gonna, if people with all these different competing ethnic groups, you know, are gonna are going to really believe in their government. They have to see that everybody benefits when it when 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 things grow and when deals are done that you know that everybody is sharing in the prosperity. And you know that was just one of the really brilliant um, things that um, and the certification structure that. Uh, you know, and, and the, I guess the most recent census now, Atlanta's got more black businesses than any other region, which is just crazy because we don't have the population of New York or Chicago, but, you know, we have the businesses. Because of the opportunities in the public and, uh, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> in the private uh, private sectors. Yeah, and, the, and the, the public sector is what begat the private sector yes. opportunity. And people having them having a way to develop that track record so then they could compete exactly. in the public. In the public <coughs> and, and the thing that helped with, in Atlanta was that uh, the fear was that, you know, if you have a pie, that you have having to share in the pie, but the pie got bigger. I mean, that was what your daddy would mm -hmm. say, is that, you know, we need to grow it so that it's just not a share of the stagnant pie, but it's a growing pie. And so right. everybody is there at the trough, but it's a bigger, uh, a bigger, uh, a bigger pie, so everybody can get a piece. Well, and that's the nature of capitalism, which always, you know, which I, I don't understand why we don't call these anti these people on it that you know don't want to share, because the more people you bring into a capitalist system, the bigger the, the pie bigger the gets. pie gets. But they didn't see that, um, yeah. and they still don't see it. They still don't see it. You take it's, it's almost like you're taking money away from right. me. Right. But uh, everybody's prospered in the Atlanta uh, region by yeah. virtue of uh, these uh, programs. Yeah, and you sure can. Of course, I'm on. Let me get off the record now. That you should. A proponent. I don't know if uh, Ingrid mentioned that, but he was uh, very progressive. Uh, along those lines of pro promoting women, and, and uh, he had two or three commissioners uh, mm -hmm. in his first. Who were his commissioners? Emma. Emma Darnell. Uh, Emma Darnell was uh -huh. one, 
and um, she may have been the first. Mm -hmm. And then they had, um, um, I'm trying to remember when the finance chief came. Uh, maybe that was not in maintenance uh, administration, but mm -hmm. they've had a uh, finance, they've had uh, two finance, mm -hmm. chief financial officers mm -hmm. uh, at the city, mm -hmm. uh, parks and human mm -hmm. resources, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. even the police chief, I mean the uh, police chief, uh, Beverly. Uh, Beverly Harvard. Harvard. Yeah, my dad promoted her. Oh, that's right. To, um, not to chief, but to deputy chief. Okay. And, uh, and some of it was because of the, um, you know, complaints about, um, sexism in the police, well, both it was sexism in the police department, how they were handling domestic violence, and also their insensitivity to kind of sexual harassment on the street. So I think he promoted Beverly to be, um, I think, human resources in the police department, deputy chief, saying that, well, since she would then be screening people for promotions, that that was, oh, that, that their was sensitivity to women's issues would be part of their assessment mm -hmm. and um well now she's like with the u.s marshals or something you know she's got i'm missing big... her name i i don't know where she yeah, is yeah she's like in i think she's in washington, she's in washington. With, the, washington? with the federal marshal service she's got a big oh, my. very responsible position you know and that's kind of a whole nother chapter is all the people who came up through atlanta agencies and then ended up running cities all you know, in other places, yeah. Yeah, that'd be a great, that'd be a great Georgia state. state. <laughs> we got plenty of work here, yeah. right? Yeah. But the women, um, I mean, because women were a part of the joint venture, women-owned businesses yes, were part of the women-owned businesses were, were part of the group that could be um, certified mm -hmm. as uh, minority partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and you know, for they don't realize. I mean, in the seventies, that was just huge. A, a huge. Yeah. The idea that you know of women-owned businesses, so. and you know there were some abuses there. You know where husbands put you know wives up, but uh, you know by and far the majority of them were you know were legitimate, mm -hmm. and that was the purpose of the certifications is to right. go out and make sure that right. uh, you were bona fide and not a front. Right. Okay, well, I'm glad we got that one in there.